Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this briefing today. Thanks to President Trump's unwavering support for Operation Warp Speed, we have more good news to report this week. Yesterday, the FDA released an internal assessment of the Pfizer vaccine's trial data. The FDA assessment showed that the vaccine was around 95 percent effective, was efficacious across different groups, including the elderly and people with comorbidities, and did not show any significant safety concerns. This analysis is being presented tomorrow to the FDA's Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, which will weigh in for the agency's consideration on whether they believe the vaccine meets the criteria for emergency use authorization. We could then have an EUA within days and be administering doses of vaccine to our most vulnerable next week. As we've discussed, based on current production schedules, we expect to have enough doses to vaccinate 20 million Americans by the end of this year, 50 million total by the end of January, and at least 100 million total by the end of the first quarter. We remain confident that across our portfolio of multiple vaccines, we will have enough doses for any American who wants a vaccine by the end of the second quarter of 2021. As we've continued to make progress on vaccine development and manufacturing, General Perna and his team have been in close touch with our state partners on how we will be allocating and distributing the doses as they become available. We'll also be releasing more informational material in the coming days and weeks for Americans to help spread the word about the safety and efficacy of the coming vaccines. We also continue to allocate and ship more courses of the two authorized antibody treatments to help Americans at risk for severe COVID-19 who have not been hospitalized. As of today, we have now allocated more than 278,000 courses of these treatments. As I've noted in previous weeks, every American who's recovered from COVID-19 in the past three months can help expand our arsenal of potential treatments for this virus by donating plasma. Millions of Americans have recovered from COVID-19 in the last several months and could be eligible to donate. Please contact your local American Red Cross or local American Blood Bank or go to coronavirus.gov for more information about how you can volunteer to be a donor and give the gift of life. I'll conclude by reminding all Americans that even as we have such a bright future ahead, we face extremely concerning trends in the spread of the virus. Hospitalization <laughs> rates are now at the highest they have been during the pandemic. We are so close to being able to protect millions of Americans from this virus with a vaccine. For now, we need to double down on the steps that can keep us all safe. The three W's, wash your hands, watch your distance, wear a face covering when you can't watch your distance, and avoid places like indoor settings and crowded, out, crowded settings where you can't do those things. Those public health measures are the safe bridge to a vaccine. Thank you again for joining us, and I'll now hand things over to Dr. <coughs> Slowey to give us updates on the vaccine development front. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, hi, everybody. So uh, just a few comments to add uh, and build up on what uh, Mr. Secretary has said. Uh, clearly, great focus on the FDA outcome tomorrow and then, and then a week from tomorrow, uh, reviewing the Pfizer and then the Moderna vaccines. Probably most of you have um, now had a chance to look into the Pfizer submission. I'll be happy to uh, address any questions you may have there, but quite remarkable efficacy, I think very good safety profile, mostly injection site and injection related uh, adverse events. Uh, one of the points I'd like to attract your attention, attention to is the Kaplan-Meier curve that shows that within 12 days or so from the first dose of vaccine, the number of cases in the study a vaccine arm flattens and continue to remain flat after the second dose. But the key point is Already after the first dose, and if you study the immunogenicity data, you'll see that there is barely detectable neutralizing antibodies at that time. There is already very, very significant uh, protection induced. I think it's very important because hopefully uh, we will start impacting people's lives very quickly after the onset of, of the campaigns to immunize. And secondly, it's something that makes us very more uh, uh, optimistic in regard of the Janssen's vaccine, J&J, &J, that as you know is being tested as a one dose vaccine. Probably in a few days, the Moderna uh, booklet will be published and, and uh, 
you will see that, that, that the data are as, uh, as impressive and uh, compelling. Regarding the J&J the &J vaccine, as I said, it's a one-shot vaccine. Actually, there is, a, there is a second phase three trial that has a two-shots vaccine, but what we consider to be a breakthrough in terms of intervention into the pandemic could be the one-shot vaccine. We're optimistic efficacy could be very high. We have already recruited more than 38,000 subjects in the study. With J&J, &J, we decided to cap the recruitment to around 40,000 subjects, which will happen by the end of this week, so in the next two, three days. And given the attack rate into the study and in the countries where the study has been conducted, it is very likely that we will have our first views on efficacy for this vaccine very early in the month of January, and that somewhere in the late of the month of January or early February, an EUA will be submitted and hopefully approved uh, swiftly. Uh, we uh, may be able to accumulate another 30 to 40 million vaccinees in the month of February if uh, this vaccine uh, gets approved and an equivalent number or slightly higher going forward in the month of um, March, et cetera. So a, an important thing to keep in mind uh, uh, in terms of impact on the, uh, on the pandemic. Uh, also the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, we have now about 18,000 subjects recruited in the US conducted phase three trial that's under the oversight of Operation War Speed. There are no different dosages. There's no different uh, batches of uh, vaccine. That study, we believe, is going to give a clear outcome as to the efficacy and safety of the vaccine. And we, again, look forward to potentially reading out from that study on its efficacy uh, somewhere late in the month of January. And if positive, an EUA may be filed somewhere in, late in the month of uh, February with, with uh, final analysis data. On the protein vaccine side, which is the third platform technology, as you know, that we have in the portfolio, we have uh, very good progress uh, with Novavax uh, that uh, is gearing up to uh, start its phase three trial. And we have some further analysis ongoing and discussions with Sanofi to uh, see what the next steps in progressing the, the vaccine there towards uh, uh, phase three. So things are uh, moving in the right direction uh, and happy to address your questions. And pass on to uh, my co-leader, General Perna to tell you more about how these vaccines are going to make it into people. Great. Thank you, Dr. Slawi, and Mr. Secretary, thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, just exciting time to be in the business that we're in right now, uh, supporting this through uh, logistics and eventual sustainment uh, of vaccine uh, distribution uh, and, and uh, resupply accordingly. So uh, we are focused on our micro planning uh, at the state jurisdiction level. Uh, re reminder of the triad that's involved in this, the, the CDC experts uh, who developed uh, the strategy, who have been working day to day with the states for the last six months, um, the commercial industry partners, McKesson, FedEx, UPS, uh, Walgreens, CVS, and many others who are uh, working their plans every day. Uh, to make them better and then of course the states right uh, our ability to enable their priorities uh, and their plans is what really will determine our success uh, every day that goes by we get stronger on this uh, but eventually right we're going to have uh, an EUA right not to get out in front of that decision but be, to be prepared for it uh, this week uh, this past Friday uh, all the jurisdictions, all 64 jurisdictions and five federal agencies locked in their micro plans for the Pfizer vaccine. So based on their, uh, their allocation of vaccine, which we provided to them, we locked in 636 locations by quantity uh, vaccine delivery if and when the vaccine is approved. Uh, as I've talked about, uh, we will begin um, upon approval of EUA, packing to the micro plans and distrib begin distribution within 24 hours out to the jurisdictions uh, accordingly. Our goal is to make sure that we can ensure the vaccine is delivered uh, on in a timely manner, is de delivered safely, securely, 
uh, and it's ready to be utilized to start administering va uh, uh, vaccine as soon as possible. To that end, uh, what we also uh, already did, I gave permission to already distribute uh, syringes and needles, alcohol wipes, uh, and dilutant, which is required in support of the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, we'll begin that today. It'll be, uh, distribution will be completed by Friday. Uh, again, only to set conditions, and if it sits there for another week or 10 days or whatever, then it does. But planning for success, we wanted to make sure that the states had all that they needed to have. Um, this week, uh, we're focusing not only on the final um, uh, planning for the Pfizer vaccine, but we're in deep coordination for the micro plans for the Moderna vaccine. So uh, last night, final lock of allocations were provided to the jurisdictions. Uh, today, tomorrow, and Friday, they will lock in locations and quantities, and hence we'll be prepared for uh, follow-on um, uh, eventual approval of the EUA for Moderna. So great news in the planning world, really confident uh, in the collaboration by the CDC with the states, by the continuous improvement by commercial industry, uh, and then the state's knowledge and execution of their plans. Uh, we continue to uh, have conversations with the public health officials across the country. Right? We are personally talking to them. Uh, I'm either briefing governors with Secretary Azar and Dr. Slawi, or we are making phone calls individually to governors, but more importantly, uh, helping the health experts who advise governors on their plans. You know, in the Army, we call this battlefield circulation to assess, you know, where everybody is, to help uh, focus, to add enablers if required, to fine tune, et cetera. Uh, and so we're working this virtual circulation uh, with everybody, very powerful sessions that it's allowing us to identify things ahead of time. Several calls, you know, uh, I've said, General, they've said, General, we'd like you to consider something. Absolutely, that's why we're calling. CDC's up on the phone, commercial industry's on the phone, the states are on the phone, and we're solving problems ahead of execution. Does this mean perfection? No, the plan is only good to get you started. What is important is the open communication and collaboration between the triad to sustain, to develop plans, get ahead of problems, and be ready to execute. Really, really appreciate those phone calls collectively by everybody. Uh, finally, we're working on education materials for the vaccine. CDC is doing excellent work. They've already per, per, uh, posted on their webpage significant education uh, uh, information and tools for the Pfizer vaccine uh, and how to work through it. It will be updated based on FDA guidance uh, and uh, the ACIP guidance, right? So it's not the conclusion yet, but it's allowing people to get involved and start to really see things so they're not learning things at the last minute. Right? Everything that's admissible to be provided is being sent out uh, and will be updated accordingly. Really, really important piece uh, to what we're doing. So at the end of the day, I'm very excited about where we're at. Uh, if you're in my profession and you're not excited, you ought to be doing something else. Uh, I feel confident that we've done uh, detailed planning, we've worked uh, through rehearsals, we have checked the what if box, uh, and we continue to learn every day in preparation for eventual distribution. Mr. Secretary. Great. Thank you, General. Thank you, Dr. Mon uh, Dr. Slawi. And uh, Michael, if you want to get us started on questions from the media. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Operator, we will now open it up for questions. And a friendly reminder that when asking a question, please state your name and publication and keep your questions as short as possible so we can get to as many questions as we can in the time that we have. And I'll turn it over to you now, Operator. Yes, thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1, unmute your phone, and record your name and outlet clearly. If you need to withdraw your question, please dial star 2. Again, to ask a question, please dial star 1. Our first question comes from Kevin Brown from Fox News. Kevin, your line is open. Good afternoon. It's, it's uh, Eben Brown. Thank you so much. Um, 
Uh, uh, two questions are really quickly. The U.K. has reported a, a few cases of people uh, having an allergic reaction, and they're advising some people who know that they might have allergic reactions to not get the vaccine. Is there a similar uh, request or order that would come from American authorities on this, uh, telling people, hey, you should not get this vaccine? And second of all, when does a, uh, an EUA uh, evolve into a more permanent uh, approval for uh, either these vaccines or any vaccines in general? Great, Evan. Uh, I'll, let me answer the, the second question, and then I'll pass it to Dr. Slowey to speak about the, uh, the British incident that's been reported. So in terms of uh, EUA versus the full biologic license, it's called a BLA. This is actually a fairly unique circumstance here because the FDA has, through their EUA guidance on COVID vaccines, actually required a very high standard of data on safety, efficacy, and manufacturing compared actually to what the statute requires for an emergency use authorization. They are effectively holding these vaccines very close to the evidentiary standard required for a biologic license. So, for instance, each clinical trial is required to have 30,000 people in it. That's extremely large for a vaccine clinical trial. They're requiring 60 days of safety data from the median patient visit. 90% of adverse events with a vaccine usually occur within the first 42 days. All of the statistical significance requirements for efficacy are the same that they would have been for a full license. So up at everything I just laid out there, is what a manufacturer would have done for a full-on license. There really are two principal differences between an emergency authorization, as we'll be seeing here potentially, versus the full biologic license. One is long-term safety data. Of course, of necessity, you don't have years of data of safety information with a, with a normal product uh, going through the system because you wouldn't have had Operation Warp Speed doing commercial manufacturing at the same time as the devel development process. You would have had then time for ongoing safety monitoring before you ever had vaccine release. Here we'll have an extremely aggressive what's called pharmacovigilance <laughs> program, which is part of what General Perna and the CDC have orchestrated with our states to very aggressively monitor as more and more people are vaccinated for any type of safety signals, safety events, et cetera. So that's part of that. But again, 60 days of patient visit data, 90% of adverse events and vaccines usually within the first 42 days, so well within that window. The second is really around manufacturing. Obviously, the FDA for an emergency use authorization will be validating manufacturing quality to ensure consistency of product from what was done in the clinical trials to what's used in commercial scale. For a full-on biologic license, they actually will run trial lots in the manufacturing facility under FDA inspection. That tends to take another several months after what now an EUA would be that, that, that comes out. So be thinking approximately four or more months after an EUA issues that the products might be subject to a full-on final biologic license. But now, Dr. Slawi, and certainly correct me as the expert on vaccine development if, I, if there's anything you want to correct on that front, but then on the, on the UK issue, please. I will spot on, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, regarding the uh, allergic reactions, uh, our understanding is two healthcare workers who were known to have severe allergic reactions uh, in the sense that they had both EpiPens on them and they carried them all the time. So that tells me they are uh, uh, known to have uh, severe allergic reactions, have had what has been termed an anaphylactoid uh, reaction, which, would, which is a systemic uh, as well as local reaction, but not uh, life-threatening. And they probably, I assume, but I, I don't know for a fact, uh, injected themselves with the EpiPen and, and, and therefore the reaction resolved. Uh, Looking into the data, patients or subjects with severe allergic reaction mm. history have been excluded from the clinical trials, which is classic. So uh, my expectation is that this is new news, uh, and I would assume, but of course the FDA will make those decisions, that tomorrow this will be part of the consideration. And as in the UK, the expectation would be that subjects with known severe 
reaction, allergic reactions should not take the vaccine until we understand exactly what happened here. Great. Thank you. Uh, if we could turn to the next question, please. Our next question comes from Sarah Overmall from Politico. Sarah, your line is open. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about state's applications of vaccines. Um, General Perner, you said that those were just finalized. Um, why did certain allocations decrease before they were finalized? And then um, according to this Wall Street Journal article that was breaking down the expected allocations, um, Oregon's getting roughly the same amount as Alaska when they have six times the population. So if this is done based on population, why are there numbers like that? General? Okay, so uh, just to, uh, maybe a refresher, uh, we are allocating uh, by, uh, by population a pro rata to the available vaccine uh, when I snap the chalk line. Vaccine uh, comes off through manufacturing to fill finish uh, only when I'm confident that it's been approved for uh, final distribution does it count uh, for us to distribute. When I snap the chalk line on that number, then what we do is we take the pro rata population of uh, above 18 years old, we allocate that number, and hence we develop uh, allocations to all the jurisdictions and five federal agencies accordingly. So. An example, the, the Pfizer vaccine only had X amount available that was approved for distribution when I snapped the chalk line two weeks ago because I wanted the states to have time to do micro planning to that number. A week later, when we were talking about uh, allocating to Moderna, there was a different amount available. Uh, and I snapped the chalk line, we did the, uh, we did the formula, and hence, they have a different allocation. It will bounce back and forth week to week based on availability of vaccines that are approved for distribution, but our formula for distribution remains the same. The states uh, will then prioritize inside of the uh, EUA, FDA, EUA guidance and the CDC um, uh, ACIP guidance. Uh, and they will figure out what groups to prioritize inside of that. Uh, I think. Thank Good. You. Yeah. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Angelica. Angelica, <laughs> excuse me, Angelica Levito from Bloomberg News. Angelica, your line is open. Thank you for taking my question. When will Operation Warp Speed publicize the state and jurisdiction allocations? And if it does not plan to publicize these, why not? So right now we we, uh, we publicize the allocations by state to the states, right? And so every state has their allocation uh, to for the distribution of Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, that is a, a working uh, number that we need to utilize for our planning and execution. It is based on, as I articulated, the pro rata to the population uh, and the distribution is fair and equitable to everybody. Uh, at this time, I'm only uh, sharing those allocations with the states so that they can do their micro planning and we can ensure a good constant flow of vaccine uh, to the entire uh, uh, United States of America. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Katie Thomas from the New York Times. Katie, your line is open. I just wondered what the total um, estimate is for how many millions of doses will go out that first week. Is it still 6.4 million? So 6.4 6 million is where I snapped the chalk line, right, uh, because that was available uh, at the time, you know, over two weeks ago. Uh, and then what we did is I pulled some off for some reserve, good, Army general officer planning, right, so that we make sure that in case we uh, need to react to some situation, we had some reserve, uh, and then I split the remaining uh, doses, uh, which was six million doses, in half, uh, and then we did the allocations accordingly. Our plan is to distribute the first dose to the American people based on allocation, uh, and then 21 days for Pfizer uh, later, we'll ship the second dose, uh, and eventually for Moderna, it'll be 28 days later. 
but snapped the chalk line 6.4, pulled off some reserve, divided it in half, distributed the first half, uh, will distribute when EUA is approved. That is the method that we're using uh, uh, for the initial distributions. Eventually, we will become much more confident uh, in our manufacturing, our distribution process, state handling, et cetera, and then the requirement for reserve uh, won't be necessary uh, at, the, at the total amount that I'm pulling off now. Okay. Thank you. Next question. Our next question comes from Candace Troy from AP. Candace, your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking the questions. Um, can you give an update on the status of the data use agreements, whether those final handful of jurisdictions have signed off on them? And then secondly, as more vaccines come online, how are you planning for scenarios where people might hold out for a particular vaccine? Uh, for example, everyone wanting the J&J one-shot vaccine and leaving providers with stockpiles of two-dose vaccines. Why don't you start off, General, and then we'll turn to Dr. Slowey for the second question. So uh, first one, D, uh, EUAs, um, 64 jurisdictions, reminder, 50 states, eight territories, five or six metropolitan cities, as well as five federal agencies. We are down to our last three. Uh, in fact, we are in communications with three states right now, and we think we'll have them completed today or tomorrow is what I was briefed this morning. feel very good about that. I have personally talked to all three uh, states about this, and um, I feel good about it. Um, yeah, thank you. Dr. Yeah, Slow? so it's, a, it's an important question, uh, the answer to which can only be conceptual until we actually know the performance of the, of the next vaccine. Now, uh, what the, the criteria to be taken into account are the actual efficacy level uh, that the vaccine has. I hope that most vaccines that we will have will be in the high 80s or 90%. There is a, there is a, there is a, uh, a perception uh, uh, associated with that that's important and not to be neglected. But if there, if there was a gradient on efficacy, I, w I think it would make sense to give the highest efficacy vaccine to those who have the highest morbidity and mortality from the disease and the slightly lower efficacy, if that was to be the case, to a more healthy, younger uh, population. I think the second point is the actual, as I said, the performance, the performance of the vaccine in terms of uh, safety profile, a vaccine with more um, acceptable reactogenicity would need to go into populations that have a higher benefit. So again, those that have more severe disease consequences and the vaccine that is milder uh, may need to go into a, a lower uh, risk population. And then, frankly, pragmatism, which is those availability. The way we designed our strategy has been to give ourselves the opportunity to have different vaccines with different performance on the one hand and spread our risk in case some of them fail or are delayed. But secondly, to accumulate vaccine doses faster than with just one supplier by having different vaccines accumulate different doses through different manufacturing sites. Thank you. Next question. Our next question comes from Graham Verdano from BuzzFeed. Graham, your line is open. Hi, it's Dan Vergano with BuzzFeed News. Um, I have uh, two questions, I guess. Uh, one for Dr. Slowey, which is, how would you compare the side effect profiles you're seeing in the Pfizer and Moderna uh, numbers to other vaccines that people might take that you've seen, maybe the flu vaccine and others? Uh, the second thing is uh, maybe for General Perner or Secretary Azar, um, I'm really just urging you to create a dashboard with the distribution numbers, not just keeping the states to reassure people. That's been very helpful to all of us in the news business. Not really a question, just an observation. Thank you for that and uh, the, the feedback on the dashboard question, and I'll work with General Pern on looking at that. Dr. Slava? Right. So I would say the vaccine that has a, the closer uh, local reactogenicity and systemic reactogenicity, I use the word reactogenicity, not the word safety, because frankly, safety, it's all the same and they're all safe. But the vaccines with this similar local and systemic reactogenicity, which is injection site, tenderness, redness, pain, headache, a little bit of fever, all of the above, 
resolving within 24 to 36 hours for immunization. About 10, 15 percent having what's called grade three, which is not the maximum grade. Grade four is the maximum, uh, but grade three is, is significant, clearly noticeable, uh, 10, 15 percent. So the vaccine that's closest to that is Shingrix, another vaccine with very, very high efficacy. Probably there is no free lunch. If you have a very good immune response, you notice it. But it's not a safety issue. It's, uh, it's actually an immunogenicity marker. Uh, um, and Shingrix, as I understand, Shingrix is, as I understand is, uh, is so effective and enormously used to the extent that the competitor vaccine has been withdrawn from the market with no issues whatsoever. Yeah. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Carl O'Donnell from Reuters News. Carl, your line is open. Hi, this is Carl O'Donnell from Reuters. Um, you know, just just curious with uh, with the vaccine doses, you know, likely to be again being administered soon. Do you guys have a plan for um, you know who who will receive that that first vaccine dose? If that's going to be done publicly, if you have any sense of where that dose will be administered, or you know. What what type of person will receive it? A healthcare worker, a frontline worker, something like that. Just curious if you have any any planning um, on that. Well, now you make me feel as if we should, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> General. So we've been so focused on speed getting it out and yeah. deferring to the governors. Uh, we yeah. have <laughs> we have been deferring to the governors and we've been uh, deferring to the jurisdictions and the cities. And so we probably do need to. Uh, make a make a plan for you know who's going to get it first visibly uh, as secretary azar said uh, dr slowey said i apologize i'm putting words uh, and i've said uh, we're all going to be available uh, if it's appropriate uh, at the time to be uh, to receive the shot and we're all more than comfortable of getting it um, you know on tv mm -hmm. etc um, but we want to work through um, you know fair and equitable distribution and the decisions by the governors, um, the territories, and the, you know the mayors of the cities accordingly, uh, and, and it's just an important balance of not uh, showing favoritism, uh, but making sure that the people that um, you know ASIP um, has identified get the vaccine first in their priority city. Mr. Well, Secretary, yeah, and uh, as the general mentioned, I've 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 made clear to the team as I've made clear publicly to the media and otherwise that I will gladly get the first, uh, first, first shot, first vaccination just to demonstrate the American people my supreme confidence in the integrity of the process, the quality of the vaccines, and that I wouldn't ask the American people to do something that I wouldn't be willing to do myself. Right. Next question, please. Our next question comes from John Collins from Science Magazine. John, your line is open. I thank you for taking my call. I just wanted to clarify something about the Pfizer vaccine that Dr. Slowey said. I, I don't think you were implying that people should just get one dose, so I just wanted to clarify that point. And the second, the question I have is about the data coming from Russia and from China of efficacy in press releases. But if they were to apply for EUAs from uh, the FDA and were to receive them, would the U.S. government purchase those vaccines and distribute them? when there's a shortage of supply of other vaccines? Uh, I will answer the second question, then turn to Dr. Slowey about the dosage. Uh, anybody is welcome if they are subject to an IND under the FDA's uh, clinical trial practices and have conducted their research consistent with the human subject research protection laws of the United States and relevant treaties to submit their data to apply for registration for emergency use authorization or biologic license with the Food and Drug Administration where it would receive full consideration. But that would require, as the FDA is demonstrating uh, by consideration of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, complete and utter transparency and availability of all data related to the clinical trials. It's important to remember the FDA is looking under the hood, literally examining every line of data, every patient. Uh, every patient identified in there uh, to look through and confirm the quality of the data. Uh, so they're open for business, but you'd have to comply with our rules to protect patient safety. Dr. Slowey? Yeah, I think it's a really important point you said, Mr. Secretary, because that is one of the compelling or most important rationales of the time it's taking. The FDA actually goes back into the raw data and reanalyzes the data uh, rather than uh, interpret uh, uh, 
a table, for instance, that's out there. I'm not suggesting anybody else has done something wrong. I'm just describing how the FDA does it. And John, thank you very much for asking for that clarification. I'm absolutely not suggesting that the vaccine should be a one-dose vaccine because the observation of that high efficacy was only over a period of uh, uh, actually 10, eight days or nine days in the case of Pfizer and is only over a period of three weeks maybe in the case of Moderna. It's very encouraging to say super fast onset of protection. The second dose is a full part of the label if the vaccines are approved. It consolidates the immunity to, to the, uh, into the patients against COVID-19 and that's the data that shows long lasting at least over a few months uh, immunity and, and I expect it to be very long lasting. Uh, but so people should not take the vaccine as a one dose vaccine. We do have the Janssen's vaccine that is being tested as a one dose vaccine where the follow up will be long enough to assess that we're not observing you know, a micro uh, uh, event, but rather uh, uh, long term. One could ask the question why not run efficacy trials with the one dose vaccine of the Moderna vaccine or the Pfizer vaccine. And that would be a valid question. Of course, timing would be a, a big challenge. Dr. Slava, can I actually interject and ask a follow-up question? Because I, I get this one from the media a lot, and I think it'd be helpful to have your perspective there. Uh, the question often comes up uh, with the Pfizer, 21 days, Moderna, 28 days to the second booster shot that one would get. Um, how precise is that on the 21 or 28 days when a patient comes back, if they were to come, say, the 22nd day, 23rd, obviously we want everyone as close to that as the, the prescribed days as possible, but could you describe for the media just the, the yes. interactions there? So uh, there, are, there is the regulatory answer and there is a scientific uh, observations. I think the regulatory answer is a vaccine is approved on a 0 0.21 days or 0 0.28 days and that's what should be done. Now, what does the science say around that? That precision is not that important. What we know with many other vaccines is that the more you space the two doses of vaccine, the better immune response you get after the second dose. But the trade-off is that you have a weaker, potentially weaker protection between the two doses. So when you're dealing with a disease that has low incidence, that's okay because your risk of contracting it is low in between the doses. So for instance, zero six months is better than zero two months, is better than zero one months, is probably slightly better than zero 21 days. But uh, uh, if there is significant transmission of disease, as is the case here, we should absolutely get the second dose exactly as has been studied. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question comes from Issam Ahmed from ASP. Your line is open. Um, hi, thank you so much for doing this. Um, Dr. Slavi, I was wondering um, what you made of the, um, in the vaccine arm, the, the, the data that showed um, the four cases of Bell's palsy. Is that something to watch out for moving forward? Is How concerned are you about that potentially or, or at all? And um, the second question was, um, are, are we fairly confident at this time that um, we will see an immune uh, uh, memory B cell response and w so that the immune system will mount uh, antibodies further on down the line? Or do we just not know that yet? Thank you. So I think the, the first question on, on safety is uh, whichever are the uh, serious adverse events of interest of which uh, policy would be one. Uh, for instance, on the Pfizer uh, uh, strategy as it's now public, there are three active pharmacovigilance observation studies. Uh, uh, one, the classic pharmacovigilance where physicians or, or subjects, patients call back into the company. One uh, that uses the VA and the Department of Defense uh, data sets on, 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 on subjects immunized. And one, an active healthcare worker focused 20,000 subjects follow-up study over three years that will detect uh, any significant uh, adverse events. I think here, large number and long-term follow-up is the key, and the capacity to compare to an appropriate baseline is the other key. And, and frankly, the appropriate baseline 
is slightly challenging in the sense that it's a new baseline because the pandemic itself has changed the baseline frequency of a number of events into the population over the last 10 months. So it's very important to take a recent, almost concomitant baseline. As to the memory question, all the data generated with the messenger RNA vaccine in small animal and large animal and with other vaccines that I'm very familiar with as I was on the board of Moderna before, is very clear that you establish a very robust, long-lasting memory response, also assessed by, by detecting memory cells and importantly, looking at the recall response, the, uh, the immunoglobulin isotypes, all the markers needed to tell you you have a robust T cell response and you have a robust memory response. And I, I think these vaccines, uh, therefore, will have long-term memory. And the, sh the protection induced after one dose in the presence, well, in the absence of detectable neutralizing antibodies, in my view, is another demonstration that this vaccine, best way to protect against this vaccine disease, is actually really a faster kinetic immune response. It's, re it's a race between the speed of replication of the virus and the speed of the immune response mounting. If you are old, have a weak immune system, and your immune response is slow, it will be very intense, but it's slow. By the time it intensifies, you have a lot of virus load, you have lots of cells infected, you are in trouble. If your immune response is fast, you're asymptomatic or you're just totally cleared. And I think that's what we'll, we'll, I would hypothesize will be established in most people immunized, is memory that gives a faster immune response and therefore long-lasting protection. Great. Thank you. Next question, please. Do we have another question? Yes. Uh, my apologies. The next question comes from John Tozzi, Bloomberg News. Uh, hi. Thanks. Uh, can you just clarify um, on the uh, numbers and in initial shipments going out, just so we have it right? Um, it sounds like of the 6.4 million Pfizer doses, 400,000 will be held in reserve, and then half of the remaining six will be held for a second dose reserve. So 3 million initial shots uh, will go out uh, in the first round. And then is the goal still to have 20 million people vaccinated in December? So the, the answer to the second question is we believe that there, is, there will be enough vaccine available for 20 million first vaccinations in the month of December. Uh, let me ask General Perna, though, on the actual precise numbers from the first distribution trial. Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I rounded it to the question, so I apologize. So uh, 6.4, uh, I pulled 500,000 for the reserve, uh, and then I divided the remaining, which meant 2.9 uh, initial first dose and 2.9 second dose. Uh, I apologize. I did round for the, for the response to the question. The exact number is 6.4, pulled 500,000, 2.9 first dose, 2.9 second dose. Okay. Next question, please. The next question is from Tom Powell, Washington Times. Tom, go ahead. Hi, uh, Tom Powell with the Washington Times. Uh, we talked about how the recent Pfizer data showed there was protection after the first dose. It sounds like you're still planning to hold back half the doses to ensure supply, but has there been any late-breaking consideration of just giving all the initial doses and then hoping that Pfizer ramps up its manufacturing in time uh, to have it available within a reasonable amount of time, especially given what Dr. Slowey said about how it doesn't have to be exactly 21 days or, you know, uh, for that second dose. Thanks. Yeah, so, Tom, thanks. And I'll, I'll ask the, the general, the doctor, to, to, to please add any color commentary on this. But um, because the EUA applications and hence the label from the FDA would likely, we assume, include both the first dose followed by the second dose. Uh, we do believe whether from a held back reserve or from ongoing expected production of vaccine, we believe there needs to be in our mind an available dose for that second administration of the vaccine. So we have done calculations of both what we are getting now, what we expect to get now, and what the production lines show should be coming. 
and that's built into our forecast of what we believe we need to hold back. And as the general said, as we get more experience on quality control on the production, we'll get greater confidence, of course, in, in the level of supply reserve we hold back for that second dose administration. But we will not distribute a vaccine knowing that the booster will not be available, either from reserve supply by us or from ongoing expected predicted production. And we are already working with the manufacturers to maximize the full scale of their production. So that's built into our forecasts. No. I, I, first, I completely agree. I never suggested we should take a one-dose vaccine. I did specifically say the trade-off when you space is you may, your protection may go down. It would be, I think, a mistake, an unacceptable mistake, to knowingly distribute a vaccine in non-respect of the label. That would actually, I think, drive the, uh, the hesitation around the use of the vaccine high. So at least as an operation, that's never something we would recommend should be done. We need to comply with how the vaccines were tested and be optimally used. I think the second point is that, unfortunately, the mathematics are misleading. The numbers we share with you are monthly numbers, right? 40 million this month, 50 million next month. But that's not how life happens. Life happens is the 40 million this month is 2 million this week, 5 million next week, 3 million the week after, 7 million the week after. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's not a bolus. It's a rolling number. And therefore, if we were, the only way I can tell you we played the, the mathematics and the modeling of that for a whole week, because there is, there is almost an ethical question there that we wanted to make sure what's the trade-off. And the trade-off is about one to one and a half million people vaccinated with the risk of not giving the second dose knowingly to people at the time they should have received it. And we decided that's not a risk we should take. Maybe, maybe by the middle of the month of January or early February when we have had five, six weeks of rolling high cadence manufacturing and that we see that we, you know, uh, things are rolling perfectly, we may. And I, I did say it in other settings, I have never in 30 years seen the launch of a new product without having built up a stock before in industry. And there is a reason why industry takes that financial hit. It's because we always know, particularly with biologicals, things could happen. Doesn't mean they will happen, but they could happen, and therefore you build a stock. In this case, we have a pandemic. We need to people, save people's life. We're gonna roll vaccine doses as they come, but we're not certain they will come exactly as per plan. And as we've said, uh, you know, biologic protein manufacturing, it, uh, it, it can be as much art form as it is science. And Dr. Slawi, I think you've used the phrase before that, uh, that proteins are moody. And we have to be very careful on production. That's really been one of the core elements of Operation Warp Speed. I think really one of the genius elements behind it was moving from clinical trial lot size production to commercial scale production early on in the development period through the logistics, manufacturing, and financial heft that we've been able to bring to the table to, act, to try to actually get there because there are often so many failures in the normal commercial biopharma industry in that move from clinical trial scale to commercial scale. Exercise the system, get that done, but still be cautious especially in the early weeks and months of vaccine distribution because quality control issues, sterility issues, they happen in biologic manufacturing. If I, if I could, Mr. Secretary, just to add two points to that, and I agree wholeheartedly with both comments. Um, one, I, I, I use the term snap the chalk line. You know, it is about ensuring that the number that we allocate against allows the jurisdictions to do the detailed planning on the locations and the quantity they want sent to those locations, right? So that we ensure efficient and effective uh, distribution and eventual use of the vaccine. The second uh, point I would tell everybody is, is if your plan is based on perfection, I can guarantee you execution will not equal perfection. 
So you have to uh, put things in place to mitigate uh, where you're vulnerable and to allow us to, you know, adjust and make sure that everybody who uh, uh, gets their first dose can get their second dose. We have time for one last question. Okay. The last question comes from Rebecca Robbins, New York Times. Rebecca, your line is open. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, my question pertains to the nursing home effort by CVS and Walgreens. Could you tell me when that will begin uh, or if the first uh, shipments and the first allocations that states will be making uh, will be going exclusively to hospitals and, and healthcare centers and uh, whether the nursing home effort will, will start later. Thank you. General. Sure. Uh, so I, I just want to uh, really applaud the great work by the CDC, uh, CVS, Walgreens, and the states in this effort, right? We uh, roughly six weeks ago, maybe two months ago, I brought it as a course of action to them to prioritize, figure out a solution that can be implemented nationally um, that would best service, uh, or provide support uh, to these facilities. Uh, and I would tell you, I, I've received uh, incredible updates uh, and I'm excited about the plan. Number two, uh, as we've talked about the plan, uh, we're implementing the state's plans to their priorities. Uh, so their determination of, I would like it to go to the healthcare or long-term healthcare facilities has to be identified first. As many as 36 states have already told the CDC, uh, as of my update this morning, that they want initial uh, dosage to go to long-term health care facilities. Uh, the CDC, Walgreens, and CVS are working those plans uh, right now. The third thing is, is that it is a, uh, not as easily uh, executed as easily said. The amount of work that has to be done in collaboration and coordination with the actual sites, right, understanding the patients that are there, uh, making sure that uh, uh, all people uh, are briefed and notified, and people that care for those people are notified. All that collaboration has to occur, making sure the right sites uh, to administer inside of the facilities are ready, uh, and that coordination. But th that detailed work has been done, uh, and we are going to be ready to implement when the first wave goes out in accordance with the state's plans. Great. Over. Great. Well, um, to the members of the media, I hope you are finding these weekly briefings helpful. We intend to continue them. I also hope yesterday that you were able to watch the vaccine distribution summit meeting where you got to hear from leaders at CVS and Walgreens talking about their plans on nursing homes, but also more general retail distribution and how we're leveraging the, the normal vaccine and flu, dist flu vaccine distribution systems that we have to get to hear from these great logistics and distribution companies, McKesson, FedEx, UPS, who literally showed you the materials they're using to shipping, McKesson showing the actual kits that they've put together at our direction of PPE, syringes, needles, diluent, to be able to administer vaccine. And getting to hear from some of our great governors about how detailed the micro distribution planning has been at the state level, working with General Perna's team and the CDC to make that happen. I just hope you'll assist us in getting word out to the American people so that they can have a high degree of confidence. As General Perna and each of those corporate leaders said, we're leveraging what already works every year in our system to distribute and vaccinate hundreds of millions of vaccinations every year using the tried and true, using the systems that we know work, or as they all said, this is what we do. Yeah. Leverage that. Don't try to build something new and different. We have, enough, we have enough variables on execution that we're managing through this COVID pandemic. Use the tried and true there. And I hope you'll help us with getting the word out so people will have confidence that our military, our CDC, our states, our governors, our private sector, they know how to do this. They'll get this job done. So thank you all very much and have a good rest of the week. That concludes today's briefing. Please send any follow-up questions to our press office at media at hhs.gov and have a good rest of the day.